Welcome to Supernatural Theology. It's 5.05 on Wednesday, and I am glad that you've joined us tonight. We're going to be getting into something that has potential to light you on fire. And so I hope you're ready for that. You've come to the right place. Do me a favor and let me know uh, how the audio is um, I've noticed some weeks the audio levels are lower, so I increase them a little bit, but I need to know if it's like blowing out, you know, distorting or anything like that, you know, on a computer or phone speaker that might not be too obvious. But if there's anything evident that you're noticing with the sound, then, uh, then let me know that, please, um, and I can fix that. So uh, we are going to be talking about the great gift of tongues I think one of the most undervalued gifts in the body of Christ, I think most, you know, charismatic, spirit-filled believers, Pentecostal believers uh, practice this gift to some degree, but there's more to the gift of tongues than a prayer language. There's more to the gift of tongues than a prophetic tongue that's given in a public setting and then an interpretation. There's actually a good deal of teaching in Scripture on this amazing gift, uh, and I've had powerful, powerful transformation in my own life, powerful testimonies for about two decades now from students that I have led and taught about this, So, uh, so we're going to try to go deep on this one gift of the Spirit as much as we can, you know, in 40 minutes. Uh, So I think this is going to be a really good one. Uh, Let's see here. All right, so I'm getting some feedback about the sound. That's good. Some of you say it's a little loud or one person did. That's actually a good thing because you can always turn it down. If it's too quiet, that's where uh, the problem is. Um, All right. Well, we're about to dive into this. I do just want to mention that uh, speaking of prayer, tongues is prayer, part of it. uh, We're going to be doing another Deep Waters session uh, next Thursday. So let me look at the date. Uh, Next Thursday is October 26. We're going to do that at 7.30 a.m. Eastern. A lot of you were able to join last time and a whole lot of people watched it after the fact. I think it was incredibly powerful. I was thinking about doing it tomorrow, but I don't feel like I'm quite ready yet. I'm really taking this serious. I felt like last time there was a real strong anointing and there was an impartation. I mean, the Spirit, you know, the Spirit of God came on me in a powerful way last time. Uh, And I'm trusting him that he's going to make these times special, a real time of encounter and intercession together. And so I'm giving it another week. Um, I also feel like the songs, you know, that I choose is very important. And so I've been praying into that for weeks. And so pray with me. You know, we're marking it on the calendar. That is next Thursday, October 26th at 8.30 a.m., Uh, And let's just pray into God having his way, that it would be a time where we would really meet with him powerfully. Uh, So 7 a.m. Eastern, it'll be on all of these same platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, hopefully. Um, Also, my wife and I are starting our podcast. Uh, The prayer thing, Deep Waters, is going to continue on Thursdays uh, at least once a month at 7.30 a.m., The podcast is going to be Monday evenings. We're going to have to get our kids in bed first. So uh, I'm going to send out an email in the next couple days with all of this information. But it's going to be Monday the 30th. The evening of Monday the 30th is when we'll live stream. And then it'll be posted on the platforms. And hopefully there's someone who may be able to grab these and turn them into audio for me. Um, I'm almost done with housekeeping announcement things, I promise, but some of this is important. Uh, By the way, if any of you out there have some technical ability and you wanted to help with uploading podcasts or any of the other kind of behind-the-scenes technical stuff, shoot me an email. Uh, A couple of you responded last week. I said if anybody wants to give monthly, uh, it would be amazing if someday I could hire someone, you know, five hours a week to handle all of the tech stuff. That would be phenomenal. Uh, You know, so if you wanted to give monthly, maybe it'll be, maybe it would take 
eight hours a week. I honestly don't know, but there's a lot of things I want to do and I can't do it all. I work full time, obviously, in addition to this. Uh, but anyway, if you're interested in that, if you want to be added to the list so you know when Deep Waters is coming up as well as our podcast, we have got the most powerful topic picked out for the first one. I can see it going several episodes. It's going to be epic. Uh, if you want to be added to the list, if you're interested in partnering monthly or, or you know giving something like that, uh, any and all of the above, email me at supernaturaltheology at gmail.com. I've sent out one email in the past two months. That means I will not spam you at all. Promise. All right, let's get into this. As we get going here, I want to ask you to like, comment, and share. If you're on Facebook, that would be huge. If you're on YouTube, please like and comment and subscribe if you haven't done that, especially if you're on the Supernatural Theology channel. It would really help me out if you would subscribe to the channel. So consider doing that. But let me know where you're watching from. Leave questions and comments in the chat as we go. All right, we ready. So the great gift of tongues. I call this class, I've taught it in, you know, many different settings, a couple different, several different uh, Bible schools. I've written about it and everything. I call it the great gift of tongues because there is a statement in Paul's writings that makes it sound like he's calling the gift of tongues the least of the gifts. And it's debatable whether or not he's actually saying that. But I think that we often think of the gift of tongues in that way, that it's just this sort of, you know, little gift we keep in our back pocket and we go into emergency tongues when things get crazy. But this gift is so vast and so powerful in its potential to impact our lives and to accomplish something in the spiritual realm. You know, um, in 1 Corinthians 12, when it lists the gifts of the Spirit, we always say there's nine gifts, and there is, I mean, I think there's many more than that, but there's nine gifts list, listed there, but tongues is actually a plural gift. Whenever it gives the gift of tongues, it says varieties of tongues, and this is something that, you know, I don't know if I've, maybe I've once heard this taught on, uh, I know I've read it in a book, but uh, that idea of varieties of tongues means that there's more than one kind of tongues. We're not just talking about a prayer language. You know, there's also the manifestation of what we would call missionary uh, languages or missionary tongues, which is what we see in the book of Acts. You know, in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God is poured out and the disciples begin to speak in tongues, yet people from all over the Roman Empire, like 20 different regions, they all hear in their own language. So there was a supernatural translation that was happening in the spirit so that even though they were speaking in tongues of men and angels or glossolalia is the Greek word, the hearers were hearing it in their native tongue. So we know that that's a manifestation. We also know that there is the prophetic tongue and that's what 1 Corinthians 14 is telling us about. You know, uh, let two or three give a tongue, let the others interpret. So there's a, a kind of tongue that's given as a prophetic word, and it needs an interpretation. Someone who gave the word can interpret the tongue, and others who heard the word can interpret the tongue. Both of those are there in 1 Corinthians 14. You know, if you have a tongue in a public meeting, pray that you also may interpret. And then the other place says, uh, you know, let the others interpret. So uh, interpretation is how you get the prophetic message out of tongues. And I will say that when we get together to pray next Thursday morning, we are going to have an emphasis on tongues. And uh, I don't know if I'll get kicked off of YouTube or anything for that. We'll see how it goes. If we need to, we can do an invite only thing for future ones if it gets weird or something. Uh, but we are going to really utilize this gift. You know, this is something we want to really spend time with and really press into. And so, uh, and there's many other varieties of tongues under the broad umbrella of prayer tongues. You know, Romans chapter eight talks about when we don't know how to pray as we ought, the spirit himself prays through us. And this is speaking of times whenever the Holy Spirit is praying through us and we don't understand it. The way that Paul says is your understanding is unfruitful, but in the spirit you speak mysteries. And this is both speaking of the groan of travail, which is mentioned there in Romans 8, and tongues where we are praying in a language that our mind doesn't understand. So Holy Spirit 
can accomplish what he wants in the earth as we're praying in tongues. I remember one morning I was thanking the Lord for something that had, you know, kind of bothered me for a few years. And I was thanking him because this thing had begun to dramatically turn around. And I just said, Lord, thank you so much. You knew that was on my heart. I don't even remember really praying for that, but it just bothered me. And he said, you've been praying for it for two years. And I said, what do you mean, Lord? I don't remember praying for that. And he said, as you've been praying in tongues, you've been praying for that for two years. And many times we are contending for things in the spirit, things that we don't even know to pray for, maybe things about ourself that God wants to transform that we don't even know to pray. And so Holy Spirit can pray through us in tongues, but there are warfare tongues, you know, where there is there is a, a battle, a warfare in the spirit being released when we pray in tongues. There are worship and praise tongues. We see this in Acts chapter 2. It said, as they heard in their own language, the disciples speaking in tongues, it says they heard them declaring the wonderful works of God. So they were glorifying God and giving glory to Jesus in tongues, even though they didn't know what they were saying. So there's varieties of tongues, and this is a gift that we grow in, like every gift is, you know, get, we have to grow in all of our gifts. If you've never asked the Lord to expand your spiritual vocabulary, your vocabulary in tongues, I really encourage you to do that. I have different dialects that I will go into as I pray in tongues. You know, there's kind of two main ones, and then there's other sort of offshoots of those that... Depending on what's going on, I'll begin praying in a different way. And rarely do I determine, all right, I'm going to start praying in this way in tongues. I just begin to kind of worship and thank the Lord and begin to pray in tongues. And then I just allow the Holy Spirit to kind of shape it however He wants to. So there's varieties of tongues. We're going to drill down on some of the obviously biblical teaching about tongues and kind of unpack this a little bit. Uh, so. As I pull up my notes here, again, please share so that others can join, uh, comment, let me know where you're watching from, and let's go ahead and get into the great gift of tongues. All right. You know, if you think about it, our tongue is the most basic instrument or the most basic weapon of spiritual authority. You know, God expressed His power in creation by speaking words. You know, prophets declare things that are forthtelling. In other words, they create the future. They are creative words. And whenever prophets are exercising that release of authority or release of power, what do they do? They speak. You know, what about a king? Whenever a king is making a decree, he's declaring the law of the land, or he's declaring maybe a day of blessing and jubilee, how does he release that exercise of his authority, it comes through his words. And that's why the book of James and the book of Proverbs in particular, James has been called like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. But both of those two books, which are very practical, speak about the importance of the words of our mouth, the importance of taming our tongue. And specifically, James talks about the fire that is in our tongue. And fire is associated with testing throughout Scripture, but specifically in the book of James, fire is associated with testing. And our tongue is a, is a fire. You know, our tongue can be a destructive force. James says that some people don't even realize that their lives are set on fire with hellfire by the words of their mouth. But that same fire that whenever we are sort of in that moment of testing, maybe it's frustration or anger, or maybe it's fear or doubt, unbelief. You know, those moments of testing our faith, which is for our good, if we just start running our mouth out of our frustration, our anger, our unbelief, then we're releasing a fire that can be destruction to our lives. However, if we sit under that testing and we become wise, Proverbs says a lot about those who hold their tongue are wise, and rather than just running off at the mouth about how angry, frustrated we are, or just declaring our unbelief and how this is going to be bad, and I'm, gonna, I'm sick, and I'm always sick, and all the things that we say, 
Instead of opening our mouth and letting that destructive fire out, if we will sit in the fire of testing, that fire in our tongue can actually purify our lives and qualify our tongue to carry greater spiritual authority. Isn't it interesting that whenever God released the gift of tongues on the church on the day of Pentecost, it manifested as tongues of fire sitting on every man's head. And this was sort of the antithesis to the Tower of Babel. We know that because mankind spoke the same language, because they had a common tongue, they were going to build a tower that reached the heavens, and there's a whole sort of history and even mythology about what that meant. But without going into all of that, we know that because they spoke the same language, God said they can accomplish anything because they are agreed together, because they are in unity, they can accomplish anything. And so he divided their tongues, he divided their language so that they could no longer communicate together and then they dispersed to the four corners of the earth. But on the day of Pentecost, God was releasing that level of authority back into the earth so that you know, with the resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, man really can reach the heavens. And God was releasing something on the church that really does bring a supernatural unity in the spirit. And as God is restoring that level of authority to the church, it comes on them as tongues of fire resting on their head. And that's no accident. And one of the ways that our, our tongue is purified and made ready to carry spiritual authority, and I, whenever I say our tongues, I'm talking about the words of our mouth. One of the ways that we come in line with God's authority over our life is we pray in the Spirit. We allow Holy Spirit to pray what He wants to pray so that the perfect will of God is released in our lives because remember, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord. The earth He's given into the hands of the sons of men and our prayers release God's will on the earth. God legislates His will in the earth through our prayers, our words, our actions. And so we want to pray in tongues not only because there's many benefits, but also because there's a transformation process that happens as we pray in the Spirit. You remember Isaiah, whenever he has this revelation that he's a man of unclean lips, dwelling in the midst of a people of unclean lips, what was needed for his mouth was fire. You know, a seraphim took fire from the altar and touched it to his mouth and purged his lips and then he was qualified to carry the word of the Lord. God sent him from that encounter with fire on his tongue. God sent him out carrying authority. He was then a prophet who could carry the word of the Lord that literally Isaiah released words that judged nations and also prophesied the coming of the kingdom and the coming of Messiah. And so we want our we want our tongue, our lips, to be qualified to carry spiritual authority. And one of the ways that we do this is by submitting to the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to pray through us. We come under His authority, which then, in a way, qualifies us to carry His authority. It's like the centurion. I understand how authority works. I'm a man under authority. And because I'm under authority, I have authority. I say to one man, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. Whenever we come under Holy Spirit's authority, we are then able to carry His authority. We're then able to carry God's authority. Um, just a couple more sort of introductory statements, then we're specifically going to talk about the gift of tongues. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you know what? We're, I'm noticing the time. We need to just dive right in. So let's do this. Uh, I'm going to be looking a lot at 1 Corinthians 14. And right off the bat, I want to call your attention to something that there is a dramatic connection between the prophetic, the revelatory gifts, and the gift of tongues. And there's many different ways that this manifests. If you remember, we're in a series right now called Supernatural Foundations, and we've been uh, spending a lot of time in the revelatory gifts and experience. We're still there. And the reason this is part of that, if you think about what happened whenever someone was baptized in the Spirit in the book of Acts? They spoke with tongues and they prophesied. So there's a connection between the spirit of prophecy and the gift of tongues. If you think about 1 Corinthians 14, 
It is the most dense chapter in the Bible on the operation of two gifts, the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. It's, it's no mistake that in one chapter, and even, you know, I think God was involved in sovereignly helping to number out chapters of the Bible, but even if the chapter wasn't there, they're smushed together, they're interwoven together, the exercise of tongues and the exercise of the prophetic, that's because the two are connected in a very significant way. You know, Paul told the Corinthians, he said, I speak with tongues more than all of you, and some Greek scholars say that The language he used was all of you collectively. I speak in tongues more than all of you put together. And so Paul knew that tongues was a major part of his life. And we know that Paul wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. He had a massive revelation gift. We also know that Paul also wrote to the Corinthians. He told them that because of the abundance of revelation that was given to him, A messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him, lest he be exalted above measure. And he talks about how he was caught up into the third heaven, and he saw things there that it wasn't lawful for man to utter. He's talking about his revelation gift. He had this abundant revelation gift, and he had already told the same group of people that he had, you know, the that he prayed in tongues more than all of them. He had this very uh, heavy duty exercise of the gift of tongues in his lifestyle. And so we're going to see that as we go through this, how the prophetic or the revelatory gifts and tongues are really closely connected together. <clears throat> First Corinthians 12, we get the gift of tongues listed among the spiritual gifts. First Corinthians 12, 10. And then we see in the book of Acts that tongues is often manifested at the infilling of the Spirit. Of course, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 10, 44, uh, you know, Peter speaking to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit falls on them and they begin to speak with tongues. Uh, We also see it in Acts chapter 19. Paul finds uh, this group of disciples and he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said, we didn't even know there was a Holy Ghost. And so he lays hands on them, he prays for them, and they speak in tongues and they prophesy. And so often at the infilling of the Holy Spirit, we get the gift of tongues, but not always. I was, I had some level of the baptism of the Holy Spirit before I spoke in tongues, unquestionably. But the fullness of my baptism in the Spirit came whenever I spoke in tongues. As a matter of fact, whenever I spoke in tongues the first time, I was in a truck by myself skipping class uh, for college to go pray for my family because some stuff was going on. And I was up just worshiping the Lord. I was caught away in another realm, literally. And whenever I sort of came to, whenever I sort of became aware of my surroundings again, I noticed I was speaking in another language and I'd begin, I'd begun asking the Lord for tongues for a couple weeks because I was raised that tongues were demonic or that they were gibberish, that they were fake or they were evil. And so I was at a Bible study with this guy that was discipling me and I repeated that. I said, yeah, but tongues are just a bunch of gibberish, right? And he's like, oh, hold on just a second there, buddy. You know, let's not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. He didn't say that, but He's like, hold on a second, why do you say that? And I said, well, that's what I was always told. And he gave me a book by Jack Hayford called The Beauty of Spiritual Language. It's a great gift to give to someone like a Baptist or a Methodist who doesn't believe in tongues, but they believe in the Bible. It's a very convincing case done in a very accessible, scholarly way. He sort of lays out the gift of tongues. But here was what had to happen with me. I had to renounce the bad teaching that I had gotten about tongues in order to remove a block that was in my spirit. And I've seen this happen over and over again where someone is on fire for God. They're asking the Lord for the baptism of the spirit and the gift of tongues. And they may get a manifestation of the baptism of the spirit, but it's not until they renounce that false teaching. They, you know, remove that block off of their spirit that they're really able then to begin speaking in tongues. And so specifically, if you were raised Baptist or another denomination that has taught that this is not real, you know, biblically, you cannot make a case 
that tongues is not for the believer. The one verse they often use, I'm not going to go into all of this, but in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. And then it talks about how they're in, in when that which is perfect has come, there will be no more tongues, there will be no more knowledge, uh, and there will, where it lists one other gifts. Well, let me ask you this, because they say that which is perfect in 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about the Bible. When the perfect word of God comes, then tongues will be done away. First of all, in context, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's clearly talking about the age to come where the Lord is on the throne and he's restored all things and everything is made perfect. It's clearly what he's talking about in context. And the question is, Okay, if tongues was done away because the Bible is that which is perfect that has already come, what about knowledge? Because it's listed there as well. You know, is knowledge done away or, you know, it just, it doesn't make sense. It's just a poor interpretation of that, of that verse. So tonight could be the night where you renounce that false teaching if you've had it and you speak with tongues in an act of your will just like every other gift of the Spirit. You have to choose to do it, like you have to choose to prophesy, you have to choose to to lay hands on the sick, to pray for them. Every spiritual gift operates in agreement with our will. Although there are times when God sovereignly comes on us and moves us to do something, that is the exception rather than the rule, where we feel like our will is not even involved. All right? This is a very important point. And this kind of opens up the revelation in the New Testament on the gift of tongues. Tongues is referred to as a prayer language, and it's referred to as praying in the Spirit and singing in the Spirit. So in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, and a couple other verses, 14, 14 to 15, and a couple other verses, Paul calls... Uh, praying in tongues, he calls it praying in the Spirit, he calls it singing in the Spirit. And so whenever we're reading through the Bible, like Romans chapter 8 that talks about praying in the Spirit, like Jude talks about praying in the Spirit, like Ephesians talks about praying in the Spirit, one of the things that that means is praying in tongues. It might not be the only thing that it means. There could be other ways where you're in the Spirit and you're praying and you're praying by revelation. But absolutely, certainly, one of the things that praying in the Spirit means is tongues. Paul says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What will I do then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing in the spirit and I will sing with understanding also. So he's calling praying in a tongue, praying in an unknown tongue or glossolalia. He's calling that praying in the spirit and singing in the spirit. And so you can go to those other places that talk about praying in the Spirit, and you can, you know, sort of superimpose tongues over that phrase, and you're going to understand a lot more about the gift of tongues. <clears throat> Next, uh, we've already touched on this, and so I'm, I'm going to gloss over some of these for the sake of time. Tongues and prophecy go hand in hand. Uh, the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, praying in the Spirit, these things are all connected to the gift of tongues. I already gave you some examples of that. Um, Another example would be 1 Corinthians 14.39. It says, Therefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. So again, it's sort of sandwiching them together, prophesying and speaking in tongues. But I think that it's very relevant that if we're a part of a church or a movement that forbids speaking in tongues... You know, you got to follow the Lord on whether or not you should stay a part of that. I'm not telling you to leave your church, but they are in error if they are forbidding the speaking of tongues. Uh, And the idea of covet to prophesy means this should be something we are pressing in for. We're asking God for, you know, three times in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, we are told to covet prophecy. We're, you know, we're supposed to be chasing after this, asking the Lord for it, hungry and thirsty for it. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. We're going to move on to the next point for the sake of time. Speaking mysteries in our spirit and the Holy Spirit teaching us. This is profound. You know that whenever we are speaking in a tongue, 
there's something happening in our spirit. You know, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways that he communicates and imparts revelation to us is by the gift of tongues. <clears throat> so this is 1 Corinthians 14, 2. It says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no man understands it. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. And so in the Spirit, we are speaking mysteries as we are praying in tongues. I think it's, that's why it's so powerful when we set aside time on purpose to pray in tongues. It unlocks a spirit of revelation. I've told this story many times. I've written about it, so I'm not going to go deep into it. But my book on dreams came from a season where I blocked out four hours a day to pray in tongues for about a year and a half. I did it once a month, not every day, obviously. I did it once a month on my day off. I would hide the clocks. I would unplug the phone. You know, that's back when phones plugged into the wall. Uh, and I would pray in tongues for four hours. And this, you know, revelatory gift exploded in my life. My dream life exploded. My interpretation gift skyrocketed. It seemed like people came from the four corners of the earth to tell me their dreams. And I started to see all of these patterns in different kinds of dreams and things that were happening as a result of dreams. And so the book, I've never read a book on dreams still to date, although I do have a few that I use for references. But, you know, for 10 years while I was writing that book, the Lord would not allow me to read another book on dreams. And I'm not saying I never learned from anybody else about dreams because I certainly did. But I am saying the majority of what is in that book came as a result of praying in tongues and obviously spending time with the Lord. There's a real revelation gift connected to it. Um, <clears throat> man, there's some good stuff here. John 16, you know, where Jesus is talking about the spirit of truth who will come. Jesus said, there's many things I want to say to you, but you cannot bear them. But I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he's going to tell you the things that I can't tell you now. One of the ways that Holy Spirit communicates to us these things Jesus wants to tell us is when we pray in the Spirit. Our spirit is speaking mysteries. You know, our mind doesn't understand it, but in the Spirit, we're speaking mysteries. <clears throat> uh, this one's powerful. Tongues edify the believer. Whenever you take five minutes to speak in tongues, to pray in tongues specifically, there is a an edifying, the, the word edifying, Edifice means building. Edifying means building. Whenever you're speaking in tongues, you are literally building up your spirit. You're also building your faith. The way that Jude says it is, pray at all times in the Holy Spirit, building yourself up in your most holy faith. And so if you ever feel like you're weak in spirit or you feel like you are weak in faith, you can intentionally stop what you're doing and just begin praying in tongues and you will be edified whether you feel it or not and your faith will be strengthened you'll be built up in your most holy faith you'll be strengthened in your spirit because you are speaking in tongues that's why i call this one of the most undervalued gifts is because maybe we speak in tongues when we worship or when we're in a church service or a prayer meeting but what about all day long as you're driving in your car, as you're getting ready in the morning, when you're in the shower. I mean, my kids can tell you, I am singing in the spirit. I'm in here shouting in tongues. You know, it's not even barely, it's not even awkward anymore when one of them walks in and I'm shouting in tongues or I'm on the floor crying out in tongues. It's a normal part of my life because I want it to be a normal part of my kid's life as well. And I think that they should be exposed to you know, things that are sort of shocking like that, uh, you know, to someone who doesn't understand it. We need to build ourselves up in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 5, I would that you all spoke with tongues. So he's saying, I want all of you to speak in tongues. And I do believe every believer can speak in tongues. I believe it's available to every single believer. Now, there is a verse that says, you know, do all speak with tongues, do all prophesy, and the, impl the implied uh, answer is no, 
but it's specifically in context. I don't have time to go there, but you can look this up afterwards. It's talking about the particular kind of prophetic tongue that requires an interpretation. And so it's saying, does everyone have that gift of tongues where you speak in tongues and then someone interprets it and you get a prophetic word out of it? And the answer is no. I believe that one, you know, everyone can have that gift because we're supposed to covet the prophetic gifts. We're supposed to ask God for them. And obviously he's not going to tell us to ask for something that he won't give us. So it's available to us. But the prayer language of tongues that edifies us, that strengthens our faith, this is something that in order to experience the fullness of our baptism in the Holy Spirit, this is something that we need to ask the Lord for. And if we've already got it, it's something we should be exercising on a very regular basis. It's a powerful gift. Uh, Let's see. I'm going to zoom on through this here. Um, You know, whenever Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What does unfruitful mean? You know, if if we're saying that someone is unfruitful, we're saying that they're not doing much. You know, you think of something being unfruitful as it's dormant. Well, whenever our mind is all stirred up with anxiety or fear or just intrusive thoughts, you know, we've got too much activity in our mind. One way that we can make our mind unfruitful, we can settle the mind so that our spirit can begin to pray and unlock mysteries in communion with Jesus. We can pray in tongues to settle our mind. You know, this is a powerful thing that happens. Sometimes it takes 15 or 20 minutes before we get there. And sometimes the battle in our mind intensifies all through that first 15, 20 minutes. But eventually there's a point of breakthrough where all of a sudden our mind is at rest and we enter into communion with the Holy Spirit and powerful things begin to happen in the invisible realm. I already gave you Jude one twenty. Build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's Jude one twenty. You know, whenever Ephesians six eighteen tells us to pray at all times in the Spirit, how could you possibly do that? You know, if prayer is only English, then how could you possibly do that? You know, let's say you're an accountant or a bookkeeper, and you are giving yourself to very tedious task all day, how are you going to be praying and keeping on a dialogue while you are looking at thousands of digits on a page? It's probably not going to work. But what you absolutely can do is develop a practice of praying in the Spirit silently, and you can build up to praying at all times in the Spirit. And I'm not saying we have to do this every minute of every day, but what ends up happening is without even realizing it, if we dial down and sort of pay attention to what's going on, you'll start to notice more and more and more that you are praying in the Spirit. I hear my wife do it. We'll be driving in the car and she'll just start praying in tongues. I'll hear myself do it. I'll realize, oh, I'm praying in tongues right now. It's just sort of something that begins to happen. And it even has happened in our sleep a number of times as well. It probably happens way more than we recognize. But you know, I my wife has woken up a number of times to me audibly praying in tongues while I'm asleep. And this is something that we want to, not a legalistic thing, but we want to build up to where our spirit is always in communion with him. And if there's something on his heart that he wants to pray, whether our mind is aware of it or not, our spirit is engaging in intercession with Jesus. Hebrews 7.25, he always lives to make intercession for us. And we want to join him in that constant flow of intercession. There is a manifestation of tongues that is a sign to unbelievers. That's the Acts chapter 2 version. Um, It's also, uh, you know, where they were speaking in tongues and everyone around heard in their own language. It's also 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. It says tongues are a sign not for believers, but to them that believe not, uh, so on and so forth. I'm watching the time and moving quickly here. Um, Let's see. The Spirit intercedes in our weakness and prays the perfect will of God when we pray in the Spirit. And I want to focus in on that word weakness. 
This is uh, 1 Corinthians 14.14 14, interprets praying in the Spirit equals tongues. And Romans 8.26 and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness when we don't know how to pray as we ought. And there are times whenever we feel helpless in a situation, we feel weak, we feel like there's nothing that we can do. We feel barren. You know, we, we do not have the capacity to bring forth what is needed, maybe because a family member is sick or someone is backslidden or finances are in trouble or there's a situation at work or in your small business where we feel weak, that's that's called barrenness biblically. And it's interesting that the groan of travail in Romans chapter 8, you know, that's connected to this verse right here. The, The barrenness is connected to the groan of travail, which is birth pangs, which leads to a birth. It leads to bringing forth the thing that we are too weak to bring forth, but we don't have time to divert into that. But the reason that I'm emphasizing this is because the great gift of tongues is one of our greatest resources and weapons and tools when we are weak, because sometimes all we can do is just begin to utter weak prayers in the Holy Spirit. I remember one of the sickest that I've ever been, maybe three years ago or so, I was so sick I couldn't get out of bed for a couple days, and I heard the Lord speak to me internally audibly. So it wasn't out loud audible outside, but I heard it as clear as anything. The Lord spoke to me right in my ear, and He said, do not underestimate your weak prayers because they are powerful. That's what He said to me. Do not underestimate your weak prayers because they are powerful. Because here I was, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't do anything. I don't even think I could read my Bible. I just felt so terrible. And I was just laying there, you know, falling asleep, waking up, praying a little, praying in tongues. And he said, your weak prayers are powerful. And that's true all the time. Our prayers are always powerful. Um, I think we're going to need to end the teaching part of it there, but... Let me know in the comments, what do you think about this? You know, is this something that you've really given time to? I'm going to give you a challenge, and I've given this probably once a year for the last 10 years in some setting, and I have seen students at uh, CSCL, a Christian high school connected to Morningstar where I used to teach some. I have seen the most crazy testimonies come from students who took this challenge, and sometimes I gave it as an assignment, so they had to do it. I've seen Bible school students and the couple Bible schools that I've taught in. Crazy miracles, crazy breakthrough, deliverance from things that they'd carried for years. I've had strangers come up to me who accepted this challenge that I gave on a web stream like this, who said, you know, maybe I was struggling with pornography for 20 years and I took this challenge and I've been radically delivered. Or, you know, my marriage was falling apart and I took this challenge and God began to do stuff. So here's the challenge. In the next week, pray four hours in tongues. Either, not everybody can block out four hours. I would have a really hard time doing that myself right now. But do it either by one hour at a time and do that four times. You know what? Take the next month. I mean, you know, I, this is up to you how you want to do it. But do it sometime in the next month. Either do four one-hour blocks, or if you can, block out a four-hour period, have some water there for your throat, maybe some coffee so you don't fall asleep. It does happen. And just spend four hours praying in tongues, meditating on these things. God, I'm building up my, my most holy faith. I am edifying myself. My spirit is speaking mysteries. I'm growing in the spirit of revelation right now. The prophetic is increasing. Just sort of meditating through these truths as you're praying in tongues. And, you know, just like you can't pray at all times in English or whatever your native language is, probably, you can pray in tongues. Here's something that I've done many, many times. It's a regular part of kind of my, you know, time reading the Bible, is I will pray in tongues under my breath as I read the Bible. And what happens, not every time, but it's happened many times, I will begin to get profound revelation. What I'm saying is you can pray in the Spirit because, remember, your understanding is unfruitful. It's not using your mind because what we talked about a few weeks ago, you want to pray from the heart, not the head. 
and allow your spirit to pray in tongues as you're reading the Bible, I've actually been taken into a story in the Bible where I began seeing it like I was really there as I was praying in tongues and reading the Bible. Um, so that's the challenge. Four hours sometime in the next month, either all in a block or four one-hour blocks, and I want to know the testimonies. I want to know what God does because I've seen this just radically impact people's lives, and it's radically impacted my life. I need it as much as everybody else does. As we get ready to close, reminder, next Thursday, so that is the 28th, Uh, Sorry, the 26th. I think I keep saying the 28th. The 26th, next Thursday, 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we're going to go live for Deep Waters. It's Waiting on the Lord, Prophetic Prayer. It's interactive. I need your interaction in the chat. We did that last time. It was powerful. It'll be an hour or less. Um, and my wife and I on the evening of October 30th, which is a Monday, we're going to launch our podcast. If you want to be kept up to date on those things, you know, what's coming up, I'll probably email you once or twice a month. That's it. I'm not going to spam you. Um, send me an email to supernatural theology at gmail.com. I have mentioned some of the things that I want to build. I'd love to have, you know, if I could hire somebody a few hours a week to turn this into an audio podcast and do some of the technical stuff that I don't have time for. If you'd be interested in either helping with any of those things, if you have the tech skills to do it, or if you, let's say you want to give 20 bucks a month or something like that, then also send me an email. I'm going to keep doing it regardless. Uh, so that, you know, no big deal. But if you would, you know, like to do that, it would be amazing. Uh, and I think it would really help. But let's go ahead and pray. Uh, we went a little long tonight, but, uh, you know, we could talk about this stuff for hours. God, we thank you for the great gift of tongues. And I pray, God, for every one of us that you would expand our spiritual language. I pray that you would expand our vocabulary. I pray that you would take us into varieties of tongues, warfare tongues and intercession tongues and worship tongues and uh, tongues for interpretation, prophetic tongues. Lord, take us into new levels in this gift of tongues. I pray, God, that our prayer life would go deeper and deeper, that our communion with you, that our partnership and submission to you, Holy Spirit, would go to a whole new place in this coming week. God, we are hungry and we are thirsty and we want everything that you have for us. And we pray that you would help us to grow in this glorious gift that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let me know in the comments where you're watching from. Leave questions, leave comments. I will go through and respond to those. Um, And also like, comment, share, subscribe if you are on YouTube. Bless you. Lord willing, I'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks.